of last year. So a lot of happened, this happened really quickly. Uh, we initially had worked with a, on a prefab project in 2008, and that was one of the things that we built on. Uh, it finally was built in 2009, and to date we built actually 12 homes, and we've got a, a are there 17, Carla? Yeah, 17 more. I chose these numbers for a little bit. So, and really it's just us, so we're pretty prolific in a short period of time, so the demand is there for these kinds of things. Uh, Kaiser Homes is our partner in Maine and Oxford. They've been around for about 20 years. Um, and we've been fortunate to work with a number of great builders. <coughs> Steve uh, Adam Chick is one of our builders who's got the most experience, has been doing this for 30 years, and working with Kaiser and working with builders like Steve's have been great to us because we don't have a ton of knowledge in the industry we're coming from as outsiders. And in some ways, that's some of the magic of it, um, getting people together haven't really talked much. You know, architects in the modular industry have been really scarce, existent at all. So like you mentioned, the Golden Trifect, you know, architects for years, that's not saving the world on their own. They just you know, come up with a great solution. They just go in their corner and they draw the beautiful box and they say, voila, here it is. You know? yeah. But the reality is it doesn't work. We can't do it alone. And that's why so many have failed. Even in the prefab world right now, uh, a lot have gone up and back down again. So there's something uh, called the integrated design process. So anyone who's a designer now has probably heard of this. And it's really getting everybody together at the table at the same time, early on. The architect has to resist putting pen to paper uh, before the mechanical engineer and the mechanical installer and the builder and the client and everyone on board has a hand in what this design needs to be. It's the only way the attainability and affordability piece is going to happen. So the project you see right here is called the Bright Build Farm. It's up in Rockland, Maine. It was our first net zero project. We were very uh, lucky to work with Benson with Homes uh, in New Hampshire and uh, Ken Benson and his crew, phenomenal folks. Again, they came in with a lot of knowledge. We came in with our knowledge and together we were able to do something that was we felt was pretty special. The goal was to do something that was reputable and ultimately marketable. And to this day, we've sold a grand total of zero of this model with Benson with. So it doesn't have necessarily to do with the model or the process, but um, it has a lot, to, a little bit to do with Benson would kind of did their own thing, and sort of we went off and did their own, our own thing. Um, but we both learned tremendous amounts from this. And uh, geologic, I don't know if any of you are geologic, uh, Alan Gibson and Adam Malley and me. So uh, Alan Gibson was a builder along with Benson. So we sort of had a bunch of great heads together who have all gone off on their own now and are doing net zero affordable homes after this, but this was the progenitor of it all. It got us a lot of attention, we won the Lead for Homes uh, Innovative Building of the Year Award in 2009, and a lot of people took interest. We got to net zero uh, plus 50% in the first year, and it continues to be net zero to this day. And you can go online and you can track the energy of Brazilbarn.org. So we learned a lot from this one. And we applied it to our next one, which was a stick build. We call it the Simple Zero. And this one is in Falmouth, Maine. We worked with a great builder named Dan Colbert, who continues to do great work uh, up in Maine in that region, uh, mostly that zero stuff as well. But the idea was to take what we learned and to work on optimizing with the goal of high performance, affordability. And we learned from these. You know, these, for the most part, are high capitalism events. Um, we're, the goal was to pay it forward, to take what we learned from the clients who were not afraid to be early adopters, and you know, their gift was to, uh, to us was to all together work on these things, and our responsibility was not to blow it. Uh, and I think we, we didn't yet. Uh, the first modular version, which was, in, which was called our Modular Zero Homes, came out of both those two projects. We won an RFP uh, on Pete's Island uh, through a group called Homestart. And we went in with Kaiser for the very first time 
and Hallmark Homes, which was our, our builder and price was a manufacturer. And we won the RFP, and then we had to actually perform and produce two homes. The goal was to get it down to about $200,000 a piece on the island, which is Peace Island. If you don't know Peace Island, it's about a 15 minute ferry ride from Fort Worth. So it was a challenge, um, but we did it. And then we took the idea, continued it on, refined it, and rebranded it. We took the Bright Built Barn name, which already had a lot of recognition. It's, we've come Bright Built Home said about a year ago. Uh, so our ads say so they do exist. Affordable net zero homes we built wicked fast. So they do exist, and then kind of like Sasquatches. <laughs> All right. So um, I'm talking a little bit about the background for Bright Built Home and how we've come to be as an entity. Um, I want to address a little bit of the why, why bother? So what's the market look like? Is there a need for these homes? And what are the clientele that we're seeing primarily? So as everyone who lived through this winter recognizes, and anyone who's lived really through the last 20 years recognizes, there's a real need for better addressing the, the impact that we're making on the environment. Certainly everyone who's sitting here is pretty well versed in that. So, there's certainly a need, um, both from the environmental standpoint and also the drivers from a financial standpoint. Um, energy prices are rap rapidly escalating, as we all also know. Concurrently, uh, electric prices are going up. In the last 10 years, they've gone up over 8% throughout most of the US. <coughs> and then conveniently, at the same time, the average price of PV has been coming down. So it's, it's actually conceivable, it's attainable, it's possible to get to net zero on your own property in a way that it never has been before. In the, in the push in the 70s and 80s, the technology wasn't quite there yet with, in terms of the, uh, the loads and the systems, heat loads in the houses and the mechanical systems to meet those heat loads. So we figured out the solar gain and passive solar, but we didn't quite, more quite there yet with the technology and the mechanical systems or the efficiency of the PV and the affordability of PV. So we're there now. Um, however, one of the things that's emerged with this new knowledge and with our better understanding of how to build better, tighter, more efficient homes has it been an increase in builder risk. So these slides are all coming from Sam Rashkin, by the way, who works with the DOE and does a lot of research and presentation on these types of issues. And this is one of the issues that he's raised where there's a real builder risk where the codes are trying to catch up with the building science and the advances in building science. But the net result right now is this, what Sam Rushton refers to as the building science tipping point, where we're making homes super tight and we're not sufficiently ventilating them. And um, so the code is asking for tightness and asking for extra R values, but not addressing some of the ventilation issues that are, are also concerns when you start to tighten these homes up. Further, some combustion risks when you have gas stoves or boilers in these tight homes. So that's some of the precedent that's set within the uh, industry itself as well as within the energy markets. <coughs> what does it look like from a, on the ground as far as people coming in the door? Is there really an interest for clientele out there? Do people have the interest and also are they going to go ahead and do modular specifically? What we found, what we anticipated was that the clientele would be largely empty nesters, folks that were moving out of larger homes, wanted to downsize, wanted more efficient homes, and wanted to have a smaller carbon footprint. Um, but what we found is that, in fact, every walk of life has been represented by the folks that we've brought under contract thus far. We've worked with individuals, we've worked with single, single parents, young couples, families starting out, young families, and um, as well as empty nesters moving into a new home. So that's been gratifying and encouraging because it really leads <coughs> to a broad swath of representation within the market as far as interest and actually investing financially into net zero and higher efficient homes. So the other aspect that's been kind of illuminating that's emerged out of this whole process has been that this, we've really found this middle market, this kind of niche in between the bread and butter standard modular market and the really high end um, custom home built market. So it's, it's it, we're able to address a larger swath of the population and we're really seeing seeing interest from both sides and really this sort of centralized market interest. So um, with that, uh, actually, I think 
when we were talking, when we were initially talking about the middle market idea, kind of jarred some of my early memories when I was a kid. I started thinking about the times when I used to go visit my grandparents' house and they had this beautiful spread of, of bagels and lops and sable and smoked fish and just sturgeon and just wonderful stuff. And I got this taste for this incredible stuff and I couldn't wait to get there when I was a kid. And then when I went to, when I went away to college, we don't eat ramen noodles most of the time. So how was I going to get that? So what I did, I used to go out and buy a piece of lox, chop it up really fine, and mix it in with cream cheese. And then I'd get my one bagel, uh, you know, I'd spread it real thin, and then I got the taste. And, you know, it, was, it, was, it was something for me. So I, I, I got the, the taste of the, the sort of my appetite for something really special. Uh, and yet it was somewhere in between. So, you know, this is sort of corollary to what we're trying to do here. Um, so, we, that also sort of brought to the fore this notion of are we the hero or the villain, and it depends on which end of that spectrum folks are coming from, but what we've really found is that it's, it's a clientele that has a real strong interest in this net zero, and specifically modular net zero, and that's been also very interesting. That Modular in and of itself is shaking its stigma to some extent, and it's becoming something that makes a lot of sense to a lot of people. And so it's it's really been also gratifying to see that happen. So, and then certainly from the standpoint of sustainability and green markets, that, that only appears to be trending up. And obviously the end result being we want to create homes that are better to live in, that are more functional than their co-built counterparts, and um, and that are very durable and long-lasting. So, um, as we referred to earlier, these are some of the completed module, modulars. We actually have uh, six total completed. There were two on peaks. Um, and we have about five that have been site-built. So these are stick-built versions of the modular designs, um, largely built, as you can see from their locations, because they're outside the modular range. Um, and now this number actually is bumped up to about 17 that we've we're anticipating coming in the next, uh, next year. One of those has been set already, one is in production right now, and there's several more to go online this summer. So as far as national interest, we've seen a lot of interest on the website, lots of hits. One of the things out of this that was most interesting to us was that the, the um, manufacturer themselves, the modular manufacturers, Kaiser Homes, has seen over a third of their traffic coming to the website specifically interested in net zero, or specifically interested in high performance. So that was indicative of a really strong interest in a market that otherwise hadn't seen some of those pushes in the past. If we overlay that interest, so the, the dark red is um, where the highest <coughs> spikes are coming into the website. Um, and earlier this year, actually, Kaiser was purchased by a larger national manufacturer, Excel Homes, one of the top three in the country. <coughs> Conveniently, their factory locations coincide fairly well with where we're getting most interest. So we're hopeful that the expansion of bright built and the expansion of the idea and high performance net zero homes can be seen throughout the country. So obviously there's a real opportunity here. Um, we can take advantage of the speed of modular, the efficiency, the climate control, obviously, again, anyone who spent the winter, especially the builders who are in the crowd, anyone who's building outside this winter probably would appreciate the, the value of climate control. Um, and then price predictability is a really huge one. So uh, folks that are interested in working with us, having that number up front, understanding every last nickel and dime that's going to go into the house before it ever comes onto the property is also a really huge component of modular. It's also a really huge component to lenders. Um, particularly in Maine, we're finding that lenders are much more apt to lend on a modular project than they will on a not necessarily apt, but you have to have that much more in reserve and you have to have that much bigger of a um, down payment in for a site built home versus a modular home. So that's been also interesting to, to discover. And as architects interested in, as we were discussing earlier, making a big impact and really trying to make a difference environmentally it gives us an opportunity to really reach a larger population fast. <coughs> so there are limitations to modular, of course, as we have learned, and we continue to learn some of the pros and cons of, of partnering with this industry is uh, the design flexibility, again, with, as architects wanting to build big, beautiful, or small, beautiful, or, you know, jewels architecturally, there can be limitations, uh, certainly from a, from a uh, 
rectilinear versus non-rectilinear standpoint. There are some <laughs> conclusions. So, um, cost versus eco-friendliness. Um, some of the products, you know, we're still using products that aren't above and beyond sustainable. They are, we still have blue board in some of our homes because we're trying to get to that price point that's attainable for as many people as possible. And so that's been a compromise we've had to make, make in certain areas where we love to bring in the European products that are all, you know, cork or cellulose based. And we do use dense pack cellulose, which I'll get into in a little bit. But there has been a little bit of compromise with that and keeping the factory efficiency and speed and accessibility to product lines versus eco-friendliness. Um, the quality assurance aspect, this has been something that as we scale up is going to be of concern. So as we start to move into new factories, um, we want to ensure obviously that the homes we're delivering meet the criteria that we're laying out. And by not having that single site accessibility and being able to really oversee and, and understand what's happening on a site-by-site -site basis, there's a little bit of risk inherent in this scale of production. So, you know, it's obviously behooving us to ensure that our performance specs and everything are really airtight, so to speak. Um, and then the manufacturing itself, the process, because of its speed and because of its continuity and um, the way in which they order things and the all the supply chains, there's some limits in what we can get. For example, uh, some of the European windows, which are phenomenal windows, really high performance and great products. We can't really put those in these homes in the factory, go into the homes on site, but um, it's difficult to get some into the factory because of the lead times and the ordering complications. So there are some limited limitations to that supply chain. So regardless of the pros and cons, the truth is, this is from <coughs> Architecture 2030, um, over the next 30 years, it's anticipated that 75% of building stock will be either renovated or completely replaced. So, um, you know, there's plenty to do for everyone. <laughs> so we've got our work cut out for us. Um, so now Phil's going to jump back in and talk a little bit about, so in this, in this analysis that we've been doing in bringing ourselves and the modular manufacturers together to try to really refine and address, refine the process and address these issues. <laughs> This is what we've emerged with in terms of performance and um, and some of the details. So, and just quickly to go back on this point, I think this is so huge because there's going to need to be a lot more people doing what we're doing to keep up with the demand. With the cost of energy changing, our climate's changing, so much happens so quickly that more people are going to. Be need to get on board this type of building. Everyone in this room, that we really talked to, who's interested in this, we got to move. This, this is happening fast. So, um, a quick rundown of what bright build homes include. They use less electricity, 4,000, 6,000 kilowatt hours per year. Uh, more insulation, this is the standard building science uh, corporation rule, 10, 20, 40, 60, if you've ever seen that before. R10 in the slab, R20 in the foundation, R40 in the walls, R60 in the roof. And straight from that a little bit, we try to get a little bit more under slab. Conditions are right. And a little bit more on the foundation walls if we can. But in general, this is, this is kind of our baseline. Um, windows, uh, high quality triple glazed windows, uh, a, a really great heat factor, and a really great solar heat gain coefficient because we're really counting on positive energy from the sun for these things. Um, right now, our baseline window is a paradigm triple glazed vinyl window from me. It's affordable and it's got great stats. And the upgrade is Coltec from, from Canada, also pretty darn good. Uh, they're healthy homes. Uh, we go, we try to match uh, leaper home standards on all our VOC limits. You know, no VOC paints, adhesives, ceilings, etc. Um, we have air exchange in all our homes. We, the first couple, we did not. We haven't gotten into trouble yet, but we find that there's been, been challenges and we've learned more and we're concerned about the risks. So we just we just drew a line there and said it's not quite as affordable, but in terms of air quality, we're not going to mess around anymore. Um, we're pretty happy with the way the numbers come in. Um, there's a lot of variables to depend on the site, um, where they are, who the builder is. Um, so $140 to $175 a square foot. For our custom home business for Captain Thompson Architects, we usually say we start at $200 a square foot and go up from there. Um, so across the board, things are becoming in at least about 15% less 
in standard homes with sink quality. Low flow fixtures, uh, this is kind of a no brainer right now, everybody should be doing this. Uh, air tightness, our goal is to hit a 1.5 AC, H50 or better, 1.5 air changes per hour, 50 pascals. Uh, you know, the, the new codes are really pushing hard to get to a free AC 50 A lot of them are around seven right now, so we've got a long way to go. Uh, and this gets trickier and trickier because it's hard to test air tightness in the factory. In fact, it's impossible. So you just have to know what you're doing after multiple iterations. We've gotten that part now. Um, all of our homes, we've decided we need to be able to get at least 10 kW on the roof. You build a net zero home, but it's got no room for renewables. How can you really get to net zero? Uh, and again, there's no such thing as net zero homes. There's really only net zero people. So who knows if 10 kilowatts is going to be good? But our numbers and our energy models show that we're we're in pretty good shape if we can get to 10 kilowatts. And as the efficiency of panels goes up, we're going to be in better and better shape. Uh, so in terms of energy, we're trying to get. The 10,000 uh, BTU per square foot per year range. Um, so we use essentially uh, air source heat pumps, ductless mini splits for the most part. Sometimes we use ducted and people are paying for the upgrade. It seems to be appropriate for our baseline is the ductless mini splits. Okay, so this, this is how we talk about uh, at home to the novice. <coughs> Essentially, if we compare this to an old New England home, you know, you're spending about 1,000, uh, about 100 kBTU per square foot per year. Typical no new homes, even by good builders, you can cut that in half. So that's dramatic, and yeah, these are pretty good. But this is where we live right now. This is what we're trying to hit, about the 25,000 BTU per square foot per year range. Now, passive house kicks it down even, even lower than this. We're not quite there. We're still trying to hit that affordability part. We toured with the idea of getting passive house um, right built modular. Um, we think we're going to do it someday. Uh, we're not quite there yet. And this is perhaps the most interesting one. Uh, and this is the thing that some of our builders are having a hard time even getting their heads around. Um, and I'm, I guess I kind of understand why, but, but our goal is to try to make the, the concept as simple as possible. So even though your initial home costs are greater than the code built new home, your monthly out-of-pocket costs are ultimately less. Because you're just not spending that money on your utility bill. You get to put that toward your mortgage. So we're coming in about the same, and sometimes even, even a little bit less than typical homes. And one of the interesting things that's happening right now uh, with PV, that the incentives are in a good spot depending on what state you're in, um, to the point that uh, right now, in Maine, our break-even point is about four years. Okay? So if you had the cash right now, you would basically, and you could buy your solar panels outright, you'd be paying about eight cents per kilowatt hour. If you were to finance that, the equivalent would be about another eight cents per kilowatt hour. Okay, so that's 16 cents a kilowatt hour. In Maine, right now we're paying 15 cents a kilowatt hour. The uh, CMP. Yeah, the CMP. And this, and this assumes all these things got more. Six and a half kilowatt array. Um, this is about what we're getting for KW after a rebate. They're, they're pretty good numbers, and these numbers continue to go down. 15 cents a kilowatt hour. And if you assume a financing, 5% of 30 years. And this is the inflation that we're, that we're seeing, it's two and a half percent a year. Um, and if you're in Boston, there's no reason you shouldn't be doing this now. PV actually makes sense right away, you break even year one. Um, so what is it in Vermont? What's, what do you pay for kilowatt hour here? Do you want to know? Um, about 12.8 <coughs> cents per kilowatt hour. Yeah. So we have six cents per kilowatt hour yeah. incentive. So for there's solar, no, there's no state incentive. It's very small. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Might not be as big as that. So we'll see a lot of PV driving yeah. up and down here, yeah. which is encouraging. 
and we've been able to have a really active dialogue with them, so it's been extremely fruitful. Um, and then one of the homes, one of, a, a, one of the versions of our great diamond design is um, going to be this year's Boston Magazine Design Home of the Year, which, um, which is great in and of itself, but it also is an opportunity to really reach a, an entirely different demographic, potentially, of folks that what they'll do is in, this, in September they'll have a homes tour and a ticketed homes tours and it's actually a mechanism for a fundraiser for Boston Children's Hospital. So it, it's through the veil, in the vein, or I don't know through what veil, but uh, in the vein of Boston Magazine Design Edition. So it does have a design slant to it, but it's really meant to be a fundraiser for Boston Children's Magazine. So let's get into the fun stuff. Um, so the details. This process hasn't been um, super straightforward in terms of what makes the most sense for a wall assembly, what makes the most sense for how to install windows, what makes the most sense for roof insulation, foundation preparation, all those different factors that make these homes the high performance homes that they are. When we first started out, this is actually where we are right now. So this is our typical wall section. This is where we landed through this process of evolution and through these different iterative, iterative stages of working with the factory and working with getting that price point to a place where it's, it's workable and achievable, attainable, all those things that we really wanted to achieve. So this is a little bit out of focus, but what we have here is, um, so this is the inside wall here, so this is the drywall, and then on a 2 by 8 plate, we have um, staggered 2 by 4 studs. So it's a staggered 2 by 4 stud wall, double stud wall, with dense pack cellulose. Um, I didn't mention just on the inside face of this drywall is a membrane, so it's a smart membrane that uh, helps to, it's a vapor retarder, so it helps to slow down vapor drive into that cellulose wall, but it allows it to drive back out into the interior, so it's a smart, what they're calling smart dynamic membrane. Um, outboard of that is the sheathing, so the structural sheathing, two inches of foam to help further break the thermal, uh, mitigate thermal bridging. So we've got the dense pack staggered studs that help do that to some extent, but then there's still some thermal bridging here in the structure. Two inches of foam outside of that. Um, house wrap, strapping, and siding. So that's that's the wall assembly that we've landed at now. And how, uh, in your double studded wall, uh, how wide? Eight inches, 12 inches? Uh, 16 on center for each stud. So, With so they're. Oh, a two by eight. It's a two by eight plate. The reason for that is so eight inches. seven and seven and a quarter inches. Hopes them, yeah. Dimensional seven and a quarter. So that is the end result of a number of different experiments and a couple of different discussions. The first few homes that were built were in fact a double stud, twelve inch deep wall, just just the staggered stud, just dense pack cellulose, no exterior foam. Um, the concerns that emerged out of that, and we didn't have any issues with the homes that we did, but what we started to find, the factory had some concerns for a couple of reasons. One, they were concerned about the cellulose um, settle in transport, which we never found, so we never were able to confirm that concern, but it was one that they had. The primary driver for moving away from that wall assembly was the speed on the line. So it was taking the factory that much longer to manufacture two full stud walls versus what we're now at, which is starting with a continual top and bottom plate that has the staggered studs integrated into it. So we're still getting that thermal break through the primary part of the wall, um, but in a single top and bottom plate. So that's helped them from a speed and product production standpoint. Plus, it was really, really heavy. Yeah, that was the other factor. So lifting, we had to bring in 90-ton 90 90 cranes to lift a single box. Um, so they were extremely heavy boxes to, to set. Um, another another, oops, another uh, wall assembly we looked at briefly, uh, which we thought was going to be great for a couple reasons, was a 2x6 stud wall with rock sill bat insulation and then 4 inches of foam on the exterior of that. So this is a tremendous thermal break. Um, Does anyone know what rock sill is? No. Okay, rock sill is it's actually a proprietary game, but it's, it's mineral wool. Basically, wool insulation. Um, it's manufactured out of Canada, I believe, but but it's it's a back insulation. It's a little bit denser and it fits the cavity a lot tighter than fiberglass bat does. 
Uh, so it's a better performing insulation from that standpoint. But it was, we were interested in this wall assembly for a couple reasons. One, that it was more akin to the wall production that the factory was used to. So it was something that they'd be able to knock out really quickly. Um, it also, with that four inches of foam on the exterior, really brought the sheathing into the thermal envelope further. Um, but what we found was that this was in incredibly cost prohibitive. The extra, the extra two inches of foam really bumped the price points up to a place that was getting into a territory we weren't really willing to go for the attainability aspect of the homes. Mm -hmm. We also had a little bit of pushback from some of the site builders in terms of hanging siding, particularly cement siding, on four inches of foam. So you're essentially creating a truss with the fasteners through the straps back to the sheathing. It's doable and there are um, fastening schedules, all, you know, all that information is out there and certainly plenty of builders have done it very successfully. So we were confident that it would still be doable, but there was there was some concern from the folks on the ground. Um, and then we briefly considered dense pack cellulose and four inches of XPS, but came up, came up against a lot of the same concerns as the the second one. Is it dry dense pack or was it dry? It's dry. So this is a breakdown of the assemblies, starting from the bones. So as you see here, we have the lower box and the upper box and then the truss system for the attic. So these are all individual units that go down the, go down the road by themselves. Um, many of you may be, may be aware that uh, modular homes are built from the inside out. So it's a little bit of a change of thinking from a traditional construction standpoint. So you start with the stud, membranes go in, drywall goes on, and then roughing happens. So rather doing all the roughing, plumbing, electrical, everything from the outside of the box. Um, and then once all that's done, they put up the, um, the mesh for the dense pack and they blow in the dense pack from the outside. So it's pushing against the back end of that membrane, pushing against the back end of the drywall. So it's a, it's a backwards process. It's, it's a very forward thinking process. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so then after the dense pack is in, the sheathing goes on. The sheathing gets taped for air tightness. So it's OSB, taped OSB, that's our air barrier layer. Um, and then we do another layer of insulation, house wrap, strapping for ventilation along that exterior foam and for behind the siding, and then the siding itself, the jacket for the home. Up close, our foundation assembly looks like this. So this, this again was driven by affordability and um, sort of accessibility of or ease of installation in some ways. So still getting to the R values that we wanted to get to, but making it something that was relatively easy, easily adaptable to the site builders. So we have a typical foundation slab and wall with you know, drainage, appropriate drainage. Uh, four inches of EPS foam below the slab um, with a membrane between the slab and the foam. That membrane comes up from, so there's a break between the slab and the foundation wall. The membrane returns up inside and then gets taped to what amounts to a total of three inches of foam on the interior of the foundation wall. And then that gets taped up here to insulation that's in the ridge band, which commonly is spray foam. This is ideally one of the few places we use spray foam to try to avoid it if possible. Um, so that's the continuity of the air barrier layer, which then comes out to the OSB and continues up to the roof. This again is that wall assembly that I just walked through. And then the roof, we have two different roof options. One is if it's a non-habitable non attic, then we have um, airtight sheetrock, so no penetrations to the ceiling sheetrock on the second floor, or the upper floor, with about 21 inches of loose fill cellulose. That gives us our R value and our air tightness. And then alternatively, if the attic space is meant to be habitable, then we'll often do either closed cell spray foam, ideally do more of a flash and bat, so we'll do about three inches of closed cell spray foam, and then gusset down, excuse me, gusset down from the rafters to get enough depth for um, dense pack cellulose in that space as well. So the reason <coughs> the air, what the um, spray foam achieves in this case is the air barrier there, in addition to the R value. So the mechanicals, uh, as we mentioned, we have ERVs and ductless mini splits really is the, the core mechanical 
driver of the home. So the ERV or HRV allows for the active air exchange. There's the, is everyone here know what an HRV or ERV is? Anyone yeah. not know what an HRV or ERV is? Um, they, it stands for heat recovery ventilator and energy recovery ventilator. And what they effectively are are the lungs of the house. It's a mechanically active exchange of air. And the outside air that comes in comes into a box where the unit is installed. And is essentially that box and that core of the box is about 30,000 drinking straws that are intertwined with each other. Outside air, that, let's say in the dead of winter is 10 degrees, comes in and passes by the extract air that's coming out of the house and is therefore preconditioned. The air itself doesn't exchange, but the thermal does. So the thermal properties of the extract air passes by the incoming fresh air, gets preconditioned, brought up to anywhere from 55 to 70 degrees, depending upon the efficiency of the unit, and then gets brought into the house in the primary living spaces, so living rooms and bedrooms. But extra air is coming out of the wet spaces, wet and smelly spaces, so kitchens and bathrooms is where the extract will come from. It's warm, potentially wet air gets pulled out of the house. So there's an active breathing system within the home at all times, so that's the ERV or HRV. Uh, and then the ductless mini slits are the source of heating and cooling. Uh, mini slits are, they're, they're, the ductless units are just wall mounted cassettes. Sort of looking around for one. <laughs> um, and they're connected to an outside condenser unit with a glycol loop. Um, so it's technology that's not particularly new, but it's extremely efficient. They have a coefficient of performance of about 2.6, so they're 260% efficient. You know, I figure that out. I can't. And we've also learned that that's not the best spot for the Right, actually, yeah. So this diagram was, um, this is a lesson learned. Uh, this is actually through that dialogue with Stephen Winters. We're, we're able to identify really the better placement for the units. And the reason that this isn't an ideal location, while it's a central location, um, it'll likely short cycle. So that distance to the opposite wall being relatively short would drive that unit to short cycle rather than, you know, kind of responding more actively to the overall function of the home. Um, so we'll do a ductless, typically we're doing a ductless, single ductless paper heat unit on the main floor because most of our main floors are very open plan, open concept plans, so it only really requires a single unit. In the upper floors, we have a number of different strategies we're employing. Sometimes we're using mixing pans, sometimes we're putting individual units in individual bedrooms depending on the interests of the homeowners, and oftentimes we're putting in a ducted system in the upstairs, which per our energy modeling, we're finding that actually that ducted system doesn't have a huge demand in the winter time, but is more critical in the summertime for cooling. So those are some of our lessons learned about the mechanical systems. Um, so we run through real quickly, this is the set of um, the Apple door, which is in Wells, Maine. These the modules coming in. And there's, and voila. <laughs> um, and that was also the interior. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so this is a, yeah, one month from this moment to this moment. And this is completely set and roofed and dried in within, sometimes within a day. Usually <laughs> within at least two to three days, for sure. This one in the season was a double stud wall. Yeah, this was Baldus. a 12 inch. And one of the things we were able to do with it is get siding as it was delivered. Uh, so you'll see that on, on the set right now, but we're not, we're doing that uh, no longer. Yeah, we have to do, siding has to go on on site now because of that two inches of foam. This is another one that was just, is actually was just completed in Carlisle, Massachusetts. We don't have any interior shots of that. And we actually, we can take, so that's, that's it. <laughs> and we can